views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Had enough of the been there, done that ideas? Tired of too much talk and so little action? Rewind now and welcome to Transformation and Change Radio with Dr. Kathy O'Bear, where the vision of true equity, inclusion, courage, and purpose meet powerfully. Dr. Kathy delivers with dynamic, engaging conversation and the most authentically brave dialogue on air today. This hit show will challenge you to explore current issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion and deepen your capacity to choose courage to speak up to greater inclusion in everything you do. Fasten your seatbelts and accelerate your effectiveness to become a powerful change agent in your life, community, job, and society. Imagine true equity and inclusion and get the tools to really manifest your vision. No frills, no fluff, just really powerful, good stuff. Transformation and Change Radio starts now. Welcome. I am delighted to welcome you. I'm Dr. Kathy O'Bear. Are you she, her, hers? And today I am so honored to have Dr. Tanya Williams with us to talk about Stop Burning Out, Reclaim Your Energy and Passion to Create Meaningful Change. If you're able to join us for our last one with the Reverend Dr. Jamie Washington, we talked about organizational change and the pitfalls, the potholes and dead ends. We talked about the three phases of culture change and tips and strategies because the key point is it can take seven to 10 plus years to create true organizational climate change, inclusive organizations. And so this show I think, listen to that one, some people, energy was like depleting, going, how in the world can you stay sustained for that long to really make meaningful change? And so, as we start today, just some reflection questions. Are you beginning to feel a little burned around the edges, exhausted? Do you feel overwhelmed with the urgent call for more change in your organization, your community, the world? Are you personally running on empty, pushing yourself to keep going? Or are you beginning to fear that you are fading from passion fatigue, fading into burnout? So I am just delighted to have Dr. Tanya Williams, authentic coaching and consulting with me. Tell me where I'm wrong. I believe we have known each other 20 plus years and been working together maybe eight to 10. Um, That is correct. Yeah. I knew you were inside doing multicultural affairs and student affairs on university colleges and campuses. And then now you're full-time consulting, authentic consulting and coaching. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and why you are so passionate about self-care and community care for social justice change agents? Thank you, Kathy. Yeah, um, a little bit about me. I'm originally from Houston, Texas. I always lead with that. Uh, And right now I kind of moved between New York City and Oakland uh, and have been doing diversity, social justice, equity work, um, both in colleges and universities. Uh, for I did that for 23 years before doing independent consulting. Uh, and when I think about why self-care is important for change agents, um, it's because we, <laughs> we need uh, to stay present and be in for the long haul. Uh, and and I, I, in, in pre- preparation for the radio show, I kept thinking this is, I'm not much of a football watcher, but I understand the con- concepts of a long game and a short game. Social change is a long game. And, and so if we have not really done self-care and, and done the work of sustaining ourselves, uh, we won't be around to, to really help that long game keep going. You're reminding me in my career, you know, 30 plus years, I have burned out deeply several times to the point where I really dropped out for a while. And as a white person, I don't ever want to drop out. I want to maybe pause, stop out, have a little bit of rejuvenation. But why don't we take good care of ourselves? I know for me, I grew up believing A, I wasn't good enough. I always had to care for others. I don't know if that was some of the misogynist, sexist training, Mm -hmm. not feeling good enough as a lesbian or maybe an overweight young girl. 
but I didn't believe I deserved it. And so I always had to take care of and serve others. So what are some of the reasons in your experience, you hear people, we just don't take good care of ourselves or our community, community care? Mm -hmm. I think that that is, you're right on point, Kathy, um, that one, it's the socialization that we learned. And so you and I always are looking at um, how identity influences things. And so just naming, you know, like misogyny, I can name uh, being a, a black person that grew up in the South, like part of uh, my generational history was to care for other people. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's where my worth lies. And um, I think being raised as a Christian, I'm supposed to always look outside of myself and look around as opposed to paying attention and balancing. And so it can be about our socialization and what we've learned. And, and I really believe our socialization in the United States in general is uh, about really... And it's it, it's not the same, like, I can't pay attention to my self-care. So I think we do that in the United States fairly well, that we are a me-focused place. But it can be that my doing and my constant busyness helps me feel or be seen as important to others. And so I'm supposed to always be doing. And doing, again, is connected to my worth. Uh, and so I, I think we've learned it very early th to not take care of ourselves or our communities. Yeah. I'm thinking about how I really only felt good about myself if my mom thanked me for doing chores or I brought home good grades or the teacher said, you're so smart or thanks for coaching, you know, the kid that I was helping with. And I just grew up with such a whole, do you remember that book, Shel Silverstein's The Missing Piece? Yeah, that was one of my favorites. Yeah. So that metaphor of the, I don't know if it's capitalism, as you said, or Western culture, white culture, just never believing we're good enough and all the other marginalized identities. And the system is so set up. As you were talking, I was thinking about classism. How is a system set up for so many of us to always be serving the very few even if we're given a management role, we're still busyness, overdoing, never can take time off. The organization only rewards people that are doing FaceTime and 24-7. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it, it's it's a, an odd juxtaposition because it, our culture teaches us, I think a capitalist culture teaches us to look out for only ourselves. But it also says work, 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 work. And so it, it's something that it's not matching. And it, uh, I think it creates this general unhealthiness. Oh, yeah. So we have to look out for ourselves in this kind of white capitalistic dominant culture, earn more money. So I'm isolated. I'm not concerned about community care. I'm trying to get mine. Mm -hmm. And then I'm exhausted. So I don't have time to be in community to hear how other people are doing. And if we try to be in community and take care of ourselves, our old messaging has us feeling bad. Yeah. And if we bump that up the organizational level, because in an earlier, yeah. when we talked about individual group organizations, you've been talking, I was thinking about what are the ways that organizations reward, but then punish. So I was particularly as you identified as a black woman, what I know about whites who create white organizations is if you try to take time out, if you say, I want an affinity space for other folk of color to talk about self-care, community care, we individual whites will undermine and punish and the system will start calling you lazy, lazy. not yeah. professional, not promotable. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I was thinking about this a lot uh, last week uh, at a conference that one of the messages that I got early in my career when I was working in higher education, uh, I was on a campus that, where there were not a lot of, um, of color and particularly black staff people. And so when uh, another staff person and I who was African-American would gather, we'd have lunch together once a week. There were two of us on that campus. It was a small campus, but there were only two of us on that campus. It would be a constant barrage, and particularly my supervisor as a white male would walk up and say, what kind of trouble are you all creating now? 
And so that was it's sort of the, you know, the care. I'm checking in with my community. I'm refilling myself by having an opportunity to have lunch, which everybody's supposed to have, um, with a, a colleague of color. And it somehow the system and the uh, racist system kind of shines a light on it. Uh, and so it's not supporting us in our different marginalized identities to really take care of ourselves. I remember being at Colorado State and a white woman, we had had a meeting like this and she's like, what if we get together once a month? And what I remember is nobody ever came up to us and said, what trouble are you getting? So even though we both experienced sexism, the inter interconnectedness of racism and sexism has such a different that your troublemakers. Yeah. The other thing I'm thinking about, what do you think about this? That we white set folk of color up, particularly brown and black folk, but probably also indigenous, multiracial, biracial, API, to take care of us. And mm -hmm. if you're not taking care of our emotional needs, if you're a little too clear and direct, assertive, you're not, you know, you're not supporting our white fragility. And so again, in that moment or other ways, we will get you. Is that yeah. am I on to something? I think you are on to something. And I think pushing on that a little bit for folks of color and I would say other people in marginalized positions uh, like around being women, um, working class folks, because the socialization that we've taken in through internalized classism or internalized uh, you know, racial subordination, to challenge that, it feels hard. And so if we get the least little pushback from that group that's in power, whites or men, or it's sort of like, oh crap, I'm going to be in, in, trouble. in trouble. And I'm going to, there, there is a risk that is there. And so to push up against that, it, it feels hard. I didn't expect us to go here. So thanks for the dialogue <laughs> about the system dynamics. Cause if the system only allows, when I say system, I mean the oppressive systems, only one or two folks are marginalized in as quote tokens. And if we keep you all competing, then it makes sense. One small push, which didn't feel so small when your supervisor said, what trouble y'all creating? Yeah. Yeah. So that leaves us individually so much. The system individualizes us and isolates. So as we continue pushing on that, why don't we look at what are the warning signs? Because I know I was so out of my body. I was using alcohol, work, so many other activities to numb myself and yeah. kind of get a reward. So I wasn't even in my body. So what are some of the warning signs that you hear people talk about or you personally? Maybe kind of early needs, middle needs, or whew, we need extreme self-care. Yeah. When I thought about that question, um, immediately for me is a feeling of groundlessness. And uh, I think by that, I mean, when I, I'm not clearly thinking, when I I'm, I'm don't have, I don't have access to all of that frontal lobe that is going to give me clear instruction and direction and process. Um, if that is gone, if I feel completely groundless to, for myself, I know that that is I'm extreme self need. You know, like I have put self care. I haven't taken the time to get um, do the things that help me feel grounded. Uh, early warning signs for me uh, really are, I want to say snappiness. <laughs> That's me. I wasn't saying that. I was not saying that. I, I start getting short with people um, or I start getting short with myself. Uh, a lot of my, and I know this is true about myself, a lot of my uh, inner conversation, some of it socialization, I don't don't take myself out on other people because it's dangerous sometimes, I turn it in on myself. And so um, when I start uh, using negative language towards myself, I'm, there's some stuff that like, oh, that's not your voice, Tanya, or that you're not treating yourself well. Um, I think you're onto something around numbing. Uh, when I want sugar, sugar is my, my alcohol. I don't drink a, a lot. I and I eat a vegan diet, and so in some ways, I've kind of sh <laughs> done some shortcuts for myself. That okay, I'm not going to eat a lot of burgers. I'm not going to eat it. But 
when I see myself looking for sugar, that that is a warning sign that take a step back, Tanya. Um, candy is not going to be the thing that solves these issues or not going to, it's that, that's not the self care that you need. Um, so I think for, I've seen in other people, I think about my partner. Uh, I think that sometimes she just the overwhelm and I, I do this sometimes too, where it's sort of, I shut off the world and Netflix becomes my best friend. So really and yeah, if I'm, can I just binge? And we don't, I think in our society, because it has become so normalized, we don't see those as signs that we need self-care. We name that as self-care when it's just another, it becomes another addiction. Anytime that we're looking for something that can kind of cut us off from our feelings, that's when we're in this place of, I need, I need self-care. About three or four weeks ago, I knew I needed self-care, so I found a kind of a spiritual reading book. About three mornings in a row, it was warm here in Denver, so I sat outside like an hour just reading, reflecting. I haven't done that since. I see the book. So those are some signs for me as I'm not doing what I know I need to do to be grounded, centered, particularly in the morning. And then for folks that want to get a handout, if you just Google, oh, Google Dr. Kathy O'Bear.com backslash self care, I think I have an 11 or 12 page handout. And a couple of those, it's like 18 or 28. I mean, let me check how many. No, it's 38. Um, I feel helpless and hopeless, more cynical. I'm just going through the motions, silly mistakes. I get more forgetful. And for me, I don't build in creative times. Yeah. I'm just doing, and then I get sick. Those are some of my key ones that are kind of moderate and early extreme self-care. Yeah. And I think that I, I go back to the, the fact that I think some of this has just become so normalized in our society that, oh, I'm just sick again, or, oh, I, you know, want to watch more Netflix, or, oh, I'm just going to have a candy bar this one time. And we don't see it as oh, we've gone way over because it's normalized now. It's not something that I'm, it's, that, that serves as a warning sign, but it serves as, oh, this is what I just do every, every day. And that means that we are in need of extreme self-care. I isolate and I find people do that, but then I'm isolating and I'm working more and then I get rewarded for that. And yet we were just together at Encore yeah. National Conference. The connecting we did, the connecting I did with others just reminds me how much, and let's kind of move into how do you proactively, when I am connecting to people, I think we've had social activities two out of the last three weekends. I mean, not a lot, but just one. And I feel rejuvenated. It's like, oh, I'm a part of a community. And I forget that I need to build those things in. And it helps me really stress. We laughed a lot. Yeah. Um, I learned some things from people. I was able to share a bit about some of my stressors and I forget that that is proactive self-care. What are some of the things that you do either when you're early proactively or like, I need to build this in cause I'm burning out. Yeah. It's funny. I, I, what I hear and what you're saying is, um, connection for me feels like that, that thing that helps me feel grounded. Uh, and so I build in habits of connection. Mm. Uh, and one of my habits of connection, some people may think this is totally corny, but I love it. I have a phone date with my parents now, a, a um, uh, whatever Apple has, FaceTime date with my parents every Sunday night. And I've been doing that since college. And so we know that we're going to sit either at one time it was on the phone but we're gonna get talk, get to talk to each other um, on Sunday night, and it's gonna serve as a grounding place for me. And there are sometimes, like the last, I've missed two weeks in a row, and I can feel it because tonight is going to be. It may be weird that I'm Tanya's calling on a Monday, but I'm gonna call my parents because I'm like I need to. That's my check-in. That's my grounding spot. Um, when I think about the things that, to, that bring me back to myself is going and doing a really good grocery run and cooking for myself and cooking fresh, fresh 
food for myself because that connects to things that I find important. Taking, taking a walk, I'm sitting here looking at, I'm in Oakland, California, and I'm looking out at the lake. It's a, a three mile walk around the lake. And um, my partner and I did it on Saturday, but after all of my work today, I have a lake walk scheduled on my calendar. And it's, it's gonna take some time, but that is going to give me some, some grounding and it is a form of self care. Um, and that, that's the stuff, it's like, how can I keep those habits in my life that I'm doing something regularly that I might not be able to take an hour to do spiritual reading, but do I have a read, a, something daily that I can take five minutes to sustain myself until I have time to take a longer amount of time? I love it. And I love that it's on your calendar for the walk around the lake, except my Fitbit. <laughs> You're motivating me to do something when I get back from some of my meetings today. But if I don't calendar it, I have a practice where every morning I am up on the treadmill almost every day doing something to prep for the day. And so I find that the more, even if it's 20 minutes, like I reread all my notes for this, then I was grounded. I was clear. I wasn't spinning in triggers. Yeah. Um, and what I know is that we really, and this going, goes back to your first question of why is it so important for um, change agents and, and social justice educators and, and folks who really want to create change in the world, tra create transformation. If we're not clear, we're not doing our best work. So to be able to review that allows you to be present in this conversation in a completely different way. And so if I'm, I, I can think of myself when I wasn't really paying attention to self-care or paying attention to my spiritual connection in the same way. And the difference between that self and the self that exists now, I can feel the difference. I can tell that I'm more effective now because I'm intentional. Uh, yesterday, actually, um, when we went to service, uh, the minister said, uh, oh gosh, I'm going to get this wrong. Um, I want to place my attention on a greater intention. Hmm. That is so much of what I want in my life as an educator, as someone who wants to create transformation. I've got to have my attention. I've got to have my attention so I can set it on that greater intention. If my intent, attention, my attention is all over the place and I feel ungrounded, I'm not effective. So before a workshop or a meeting or people are doing work on the phone, even five minutes of breathing, I do wall push-ups. These are the mm -hmm. short term, you know, if you have weights around you or just a quick walk around, while you're focusing on what are the positive intentions, my hopes for this meeting, how do I intend to show up? Yes. And even doing a body scan as you're talking, how triggered am I? How much in need of self-care am I? Deep breathing, mm -hmm. drinking some water, maybe eating something that's healthy so that I have the energy to be in that meeting. Exactly. And, and the focus that I've really done my work. It's not... We get so caught in the, um, I've got to make sure I have all the content down. We forget about like the process of really being in my body, being in my mind, being centered so that I can do my best work at the same time. In the last couple of years, somebody did something on YouTube where you're standing up hands on hips, yeah. kind of breathing. Yeah. What was it? <laughs> we talk about, in my coaching program, we talk about it as uh, your, your, your super person, Superman pose of just really, it's that groundedness. Like, how am I going to, um, oh, we had a, a specific name for it and I can't remember it, but it, it's, what is the image that I want to project? I need to see it first visually in my mind so that I can pr project that. Uh, if I am telling myself all kinds of negative things, that is actually what's going to project through my body. I love it. So the self-work that I know, you know, from the navigating triggers work, mm -hmm. just changing our thoughts and then the imaging. And I've been doing the grizzly bear when it goes oh, yeah. kind of stands up. They're not aggressive. They're just right. checking out the area, checking out their body. If they've got young ones or making sure they're safe. And so 
some kind of visualization before things can be a way to get grounded, as you're saying. So whatever works for you. And in the packet again, Dr. Kathy Bear backslash just self-care, all one word, there's some worksheets. How do I use my time? How satisfied am I with how I use my time? And even something as quick as listing what you've done all week and which one brought you rejuvenation or joy. That's a check. Or what's that? Yeah. What's that? Uh, uh a cross. cross. Yeah. Something. <laughs> and then you kind of put a dash by ones you're like, yeah. Or maybe a question mark, like it was okay, but nothing great. Mm -hmm. Watched a movie Saturday night. It was okay, but it wasn't rejuvenating. And what have you been doing that actually is draining? Mm -hmm. So plus question mark negative, what's draining? And how do you get more pluses, more joy in your world? So everybody listen, take a deep breath. What about extreme self-care? What are some ways when people are close to burnout or at burnout, what are some ways that they can maybe get more quick rejuvenation or do what they need to do? <laughs> what flashed in my mind is they can take their power back and name that they need more self-care. That like, because honestly, I think some of this is attached to, we give our power away all the time that, um, or that we don't realize that we actually have agency over our lives. That it's okay to say that I'm tired. It's okay to say, um, I feel really worn out right now. And by just naming that, by just speaking your truth for yourself, regain some of your agency. That's that like, yes, this is what is going on for me. So from this place of what is true, what choices am I going to make? Um, so I, extreme self-care, uh, I think sometimes, um, we get confused with, uh, when we need extreme self-care, uh, that if we just, you know, drop out of everything, we can just, instead of, <laughs> instead of taking self-care, we collapse, uh, as a, as opposed to, you know, saying, all right, I actually do need to go read or I do need to go. I'm an introvert. And back at the conference last week, after we actually fi finished our workshop, I, I was clear that not only was I mentally exhausted, the workshop was fantastic. I enjoyed myself, but I had had way too many people for too many days in a row. And so I went and took myself to lunch and had a great quiet lunch by myself. And I got back to my hotel room. I'm like, I think I'm going to lay down for a little bit. And that laying down for a little bit became two hours of a nap. And so <laughs> really being able to check in with yourself and, and do the thing that feeds you. Um, uh, it, this probably will sound odd to some people. There is, uh, some people might be familiar with her. Um, there's a, I think of her as an educator. Uh, uh, she's really creating a revolution in the world, I believe, around women and women taking their power back. Her name is Mama Gina, but her, her real name is Regina Thomas Hour. Um, but she talks about pleasure and the importance of pleasure and us seeking pleasure and that being the thing that actually will lead us to transformation. So many of us, um, and she names it specifically around uh, folks who identify as women, have disconnected ourselves from pleasure because we are about serving everyone else. Um, and she says, if people could get, if women can get back in touch with that pleasure and, and what is pleasurable to us, we probably wouldn't get to the need of extreme self-care uh, because we would, would have been checking in with ourselves the whole time and saying, you know, that's not good for me, or that isn't going to be the thing that, that brings me, I don't feel good about this, and I'm going to choose something different. I would also, and I have not read her book yet, um, though I totally want to, Adrienne Marie Brown has a new book out called Pleasure Activism, mm -hmm. and I think that I think they're both on to something that it's, I think we hear pleasure as, again, taking care of only self. 
but it's really telling ourselves the truth of ourselves. We do so many things that we don't find pleasurable or don't find um, enjoyable, and then we end up getting burned out because we're doing all of the things that we don't care about. How do we start to recenter ourselves to what is actually going to bring me joy? I love that you ended on joy because as someone who's an alcoholic, there was there's so many ways I did and still could because I relate to the sugar, find false pleasure. But when <laughs> I use the word joy at that workshop that we did, I was so full of joy. Yes. And engaging people. And so what brings us joy doing more of that while we also find ways to feel joy in the work of social change. Yeah. Um, if listeners are listening, we're kind of skipping the break because there's so much that's going on. I've never skipped a break before, but we just kind of kept going. I know for me, I needed to do therapy several times because I was so out of my body and 12 step work that's were ways to get so that I could pay more attention. And still this spring, if we had done this six weeks ago, I'd been in a very different space because I was close to burnout. Yeah. And I needed to take a day or two off and really get serious about how I'm going to change my life because uh, I was overdoing again. I am a, a huge proponent of therapy. And, uh, and really, it's, I think about it as how do I get really good attention? That might even be with just really great friends who can listen well. How do I get great attention to um, process my my own thinking again because our brains get into this spinning state how do i slow myself down or enough to feel listened to um and therapists are bringing a lot more than just listening and so i don't want to shortchange that um but yeah that is if i am in an extreme self-care need i need more than to go get my nails done or i don't get my nails done anyway let's be real I was surprised. I didn't think. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I don't get my nails done. Um, I will get a good pedicure, though. But it's some. Sometimes we think that that is. Oh, if I just go get a pedicure, or if I. That's not good. That is, uh, with an organization I work with uh, named Leadership, we talk about resilience. Um, that is not self care and grit. That those things, those are sort of like that helps me feel good. I I want joy in my life. I want the the depth of relating, the depth of relating my, with myself and others that is going to be way more sustaining than nails are beautiful, but they're not the thing that's going to help me experience this this world and this life better. I love it. Massages, I wish everyone yeah. could do them several times a month. They yeah. literally physically are healing. And some of the ways people think about self-care has a class cut to it for yes. sure. Um, would you mind just letting our listeners know how they can contact you and maybe some of the ways you're of service in the world? Sure. I, uh, as Kathy talked about, I have um, my own consulting and coaching. And, and so I do work with organizations and uh, colleges and universities to, to do work um, have us reflecting on things like self-care and, uh, you know, resilience, but also uh, looking at equity and really creating more equity within organizations. I also uh, do individual coaching. And so it, it might be executive coaching, uh, working with executive directors of organizations, nonprofits, um, and uh, other people in organizations, but I also do individual coaching, leadership coaching, uh, that uh, if folks are thinking, you know, I think I, I want to do some deep reflection around a particular area of my life, and I want to grow in a different way, and I want someone to be along that path with me as I do this work and to engage me, I do that kind of work as well. Um, I am, I, I, I love saying this because it, it moves me closer and more intentionally towards this I am in the process of, of writing a book uh, that, yeah, <laughs> that really helps us reflect on uh, the ways that we've internalized the oppressive systems that we uh, are living in and how we can live from a place of liberation, even in these oppressive systems, um, and hope to move towards some uh, group coaching, but also 
um, some deeper retreats uh, that have us reflecting in community as we do that work. So lots ahead always. Uh, the dreams are big. I love it. And how can people find your work? Yes. So easy. Um, I, I, I believe it's easy. Um, my <clears throat> my uh, logo is an acorn. And so I think of the seed within ourselves uh, that produces all the greatness. The, the acorn is a small thing that produces this beautiful oak, tr oak tree. And so my website is www.authenticseeds.com. Uh, I'm sorry, .org, it's not .com. So www.authenticseeds, authenticseeds.org. Uh, that's an easy way to send me a note, obviously email. I'm on uh, Instagram and um, Facebook as Authentic Seeds as well. And so people can find me there. I love it. And I love how you're writing a book. Because I found writing my book on self-care really healing and reminding me of all the things I share with others. And so people journaling or writing can be useful. But if folks want my book, you can get a free download, a PDF. Again, go to my website, drkathyobear.com backslash self-care book, all one word, self-care book. The handouts, just website, drkathyobear.com slash self-care. And then if you want my webinar, which is about self-care, just drkathybear.com backslash self-care webinar. They're easy this week. So you can download those things, watch them, bring people together to watch the self-care webinar, do the activities together with the handouts. Because as Tanya talked about, forming a community, a peer group, yes, you can have a mentor and coach, and you can also bring together a peer group that can, in your organization or across the community that might support you. So everybody take another deep breath. So what I'd like to do is move into what you talked about around healing kind of internalized oppression, whether it's racism, sexism, disability, oppression, classism, because I'm beginning to wonder if there's differences in different interventions. If you're self-care out of your privileged identity, so me as a white person, someone as a person of color or whatever identity we do. And so I wonder if you would talk about What's your thinking about strategies if you're mostly triggered or in needing of self-care from privileged or marginalized? So what immediately comes to mind is <clears throat> if I am deeply into um, my internalized, the ways that I've internalized my worth as a marginalized group member in a society that's based on oppression, um, I might not even think that I need self-care because my worth is, is, is subordinated. I, I don't have as much worth. And so some of it is really, I, I really think, and I hadn't thought about this before, um, it will be hard for some members of marginalized groups to even get access to the need for self-care. And that just feels feels very heavy. Yeah. Um, I know when I had not really started to explore my internalized racism, um, numbing was my self-care. That it literally was, uh, I just need to survive. And the way that I survive is it, you know, I eat more or I eat the things that I'm, I know don't make me feel good, but it brings me comfort um, in oppressive societies. And so that feels that, that, that is an important thing to say that, you know, working on any of the ways that we have internalized oppression is necessary. That, that can be a form of self-care because that then can open you up to recognizing, okay, there is, other things that I can do. Um, I don't have to keep numbing or I don't have to just survive, but I am, my worth is such, my agency is such that I can take better care of myself. And I am, I want to, to, to be around to contribute in a different way to um, change in society. Uh, I don't, I don't have to just deal with this. Um, I think you mentioned this earlier. Uh, that 
the self-care that we see on television or, you know, self-care does not have to cost anything. Reflection can be self-care. And so when I think about class, we, we, we see, you know, go, go on a vacation, go, um, you know, take a day off from work. That's not accessible to everybody. And, and I want to help people know that care, self-care, really taking care of yourself does not have to cost a thing. It really can be about um, sitting quietly and allowing yourself to, you know, take a, a little bit of time in the morning to just sit still. Like meditation can be self-care to clear your mind and to focus on your breathing. And um, it doesn't have to be this long, extensive, I go away on a, a, a trip or something to feel like I'm caring for myself. And as I hear you, I'm wondering about affinity spaces because folks mm -hmm. in our marginalized identity, there's just so much coming at us. The current context, whether it's race, class, gender identity, sexuality, sex assigned at birth, I could disability, I could keep going. And so I wonder if pulling people together, similar marginalized identities is talking about what everything that's coming at us from outside as well as in the organization. And therefore, what's our stress level zero to 10? And then therefore, how do we support each other in community care and support each other individually doing self-care? I think that's powerful. Um, affinity spaces uh, can be um, wonderful locations to not feel so alone. And so, you know, that's another form of that community, creating that community. I, I worry and I want people to be really thoughtful about creating affinity spaces because affinity spaces also can be places where we ratchet up mm. our stress because it becomes a place of venting. And I, I want to balance venting with support. And so it, you know, if if I'm sitting with five people that I trust, I can vent, but I also I, I don't want it to turn into a oh, oh mine is worse than yours and mine is and every by you know by the end of it everybody's like it's worse than we ever thought and I never want to go back to a, a specific workspace, but it can be a this is what's going on for me because I'm I'm wanting to share, and I trust and can hold these this group will hold it in confidence and move to a place of, well, so let's strategize and how we can support each other. That's the place where we're really building community. Yep. The constant, you know, ratcheting up, it, it's, it's acting out the same system that we have learned. And so how can we support each other? And what are some of the organizational climate behaviors of leaders that we are colluding with, mm -hmm. out of survival maybe, yeah. Because here's my vision. What if, if we stay on race for a minute, what if whites gathered and talked about what we do as whites that might keep ratcheting up self-care needs for everybody, but what is our role to speak up? Because I think a white person organization can say, huh, let's do a lunch and learn using Kathy's book. It's free. Yeah. Everybody read it. One organization came together and then did racial affinity spaces to talk about. So use the book as a start because it's free. And then maybe there's a book by a person of color about self-care that you named yep. and some racial affinity spaces. But they also come together and how can whites use our white privilege to say to leaders, you know, we had this lunch and learn and actually there are some themes that came out and we'd like to have an open forum to talk about unintended practices, comments that actually are undermining productivity, inclusion, performance, in the short term, it looks like, but we're all running around like Energizer Bunny and retention's an issue. Can we come together and have a systemic conversation? I think that is super powerful. Um, and in that same way, like the white person or white people who take that, you know, who, who use themselves and use their power to make that statement, how do other white people not leave them out there by themselves? But again, it is community care for all of us that we would actually feel less worn out and burned out by all of us if we didn't feel like we're alone in it. So how can we actually do same affinity group 
support for individuals taking risk, but then also do some cross. Yes. You know, what would it mean for me to see a white colleague, you know, not, not in the way of I'm praising you because you finally, you know, took the chance to do this, but to say, I saw you. I appreciate that. I'm going to treat you as a human being that I saw that you took a risk. And that's that cross. Yeah, we have to relearn and re, um, if we want to get something different, if we want to have a world that is different, we're actually going to have to do something different. And I've heard many whites, as I've done this work out in organizations around self-care in my webinars, say, I don't deserve self-care. I have so much white privilege. For me, I have so much class privilege. So you're shaking your head. Martyrdom didn't serve, hasn't served anybody yet. So mm -hmm. I, I, it is, I wish we could, and this, this probably sounds ridiculous. I wish we could get rid of the word deserve because we all deserve. Mm. We deserve a better world. And so I'm not, I'm not trying to, that, that for me gets into a capitalist mindset of um, you've got to be deserving to get something. My very, like your very, my very presence on this earth means that we are worth like having the stuff that everyone needs and everyone has access, needs access to. So it's not, I, I feel like that can be a very self-focused way of thinking of, well, I want to, it still, it still turns into that, you know, poor me. I want to show you, show that I am understanding that I have all of this power and privilege. Yes, you do. And it doesn't mean that you don't deserve something. It means that you have more of an opportunity to work towards something. Martyrdom doesn't serve people. It, it never has. <laughs> well, as I'm listening, it could be another way we whites or men or heterosexuals or folks with class privilege go, oh, I'm a good one. See how exhausted yeah. I am, how much I'm doing. Um, that Energizer Bunny, as opposed to let's bring whites together. What are the racist behaviors and attitudes that we keep perpetuating or staying silent on that contributes to the stress and burnout and passion fatigue of first folk of color? Mm -hmm. How do we learn to show up in partnerships, working with, following the leadership of? And part of that is, as you said earlier, in our privileged identities, having a balanced life so that we are clear instrument and we're not triggered and we're perpetuating negative oppressive dynamics. Exactly. Um, and again, I, I appreciate you saying that, that if people are in the space of what will show that I'm a good one, uh, I, that's, that is not the work that's going to transform. Um, that actually is not work. Uh, it is getting in the space of, uh, it's, it's that artificial level of, I don't really understand the depth of, what is it, it going to take for us to transform things? But I can show right now on the surface level that I have the right words or the right language or, and that words never, <laughs> yeah, words are not, not the work. It's no. the depth of understanding that we need because from that depth of understanding, our actions will be different. So as everyone takes one more deep breath and we move towards closing, do you have any final thoughts or wonders? Because I know you talk a lot about healing and liberation and your coaching and consulting and just your being in the world and any final thoughts? And then I'd love you to share again how people can contact you. I think I go back to, um, I want people to I, I want people to be thoughtful about the, that self-care is not a surface thing. It really is you are caring for your very being. Mm. And so the sugar, if, I've got to tell myself, the sugar is not caring for my very being. The um, getting a pedicure is not caring, it's taking care of a surface of my being, but it's not caring for my, so how do we really deepen our understanding of self-care and really start to move towards that level of self-care? Uh, I think that that's what I really want people to, to, to think about and focus on. 
hope you may come back because I would love to have more dialogue about your healing internalized racism. Because mm -hmm. I know as a woman and as a lesbian, and I still have work to do around internalized sizeism, until I did that deeper level of work, I did not believe I deserved or um, could change my life. Um, yeah. And in my arrogance and my whiteness and class privilege, I thought I deserved more things to serve me. Uh, mm -hmm. And so until I did the healing in my believing I was superior and deserved the world, then I didn't, and I'm not always in humility, but I do think self-care comes from a place of humility. I can't do it all. I shouldn't do it all. Yep. I actually create harm if I try to do it all to me and others. Exactly. And it's uh, one, of, one of the things I'm learning is that there can be some fine lines in this work that if we look at something one way, it, um, I, don't, I don't know how to do this in a, a short form, but that it can look like, like we're doing well, but the, the, the deeper version of it is more effective. So we can put a shine on it and have it be like, okay, it looks like I'm, I'm doing all this work, but when we do it at a deeper level, we can understand the work differently. So yes, I would love to come back to talk about internalized oppression and the ways that we, um, yeah, that, that we can't actually do deeper self-care until we've done that work. Well, I am so grateful you came on, Dr. Tanya Williams. Please go check out her website, www.authenticseeds.org. -E and I know you also do other ways. You've been on different webinars with me and podcasts so people can find you probably on YouTube as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And keep an eye out for all that she's putting out into the world and the yes. conferences. You can see her at White Privilege Conference, Encore. What other conferences do you present at? Um, I've been at the Contemplative Mind in Higher Education Conference uh, that comes in the, the spring. And I'm hoping to get to uh, NAS uh, NASPA's um, National Multicultural Institute this year. Uh, and yeah, I, I like conference presentations because it allows for me to keep getting that information and feedback and, and hear how people are thinking. Well, thank you again for coming to the radio show and also for the work we get to do in the world together. Yes, I'm just so grateful. Thanks for having me, Kathy. Always fun. Always fun. And I hope you all join me next time, Monday, June 1st, what I'm so excited about, it's 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 p.m. Pacific. I'm going to have Dr. Shelley Tachluk, who's done so much work around designing white affinity accountability spaces through Aware LA, as well as a couple of her books. And I'll be sharing some of the work I do around creating affinity spaces. And I think the work we'll share can work for other privileged identities. And so how do we recognize and own privilege get whites to really talk about the racist attitudes, behaviors, and how do we learn to show up and partner effectively? Not look at me, but how do we follow the leadership, the partnership of folk of color, indigenous folk, multiracial, biracial folk, as collectively we create greater racial justice, dismantle racism in the systems around us as well as in the organization. So I hope you'll join us Monday, July 1st. And Dr. Tanya Williams, Authentic Seeds, Coaching, Consulting. Thank you so much for your work and your being in the world. Thank With you, that, Kathy. we'll see you all next month. Have a good month. Take good care. You've been listening to Dr. Kathy O'Bear on Transformation Talk Radio. Thanks for tuning in, and be sure to catch us next time as Kathy inspires listeners to become agents of change, motivate, innovate, and speak truth to power. Step into the courageous you that will change the world. Connect to life-changing conversations to extend your reach. For more information on Kathy and her work, please visit drkathyobear.com. That's drkathyobear.com.